Now notice what Satan is known to be at John chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. So notice that there's a group of people who is out to seek to kill Jesus. Why is that? Because ever since the beginning, verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the what? Beginning. beginning. Okay, so you've got to understand this, that Satan, our adversary, he was always a murderer from where? The beginning. So if you look through your Bible and throughout all of history, Satan, he always held a record of murder, of murder. He is an adversary, a wicked being that always commits murder against uh, God's people as well as uh, taking innocent lives, innocent lives. So Satan, ever since the beginning, he killed, starting with Adam and Eve. He lied to them. Ye will, you're not going to die once you know good and evil. He did it with Cain. Cain was the first murderer. And then throughout that time, we've got to understand that Satan has always been a killer. He even killed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the adversary. He demon-possessed some of the Jewish leaders and people that time, and then G uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus Christ was the only being who dared the devil and said, Who is my adversary? Let him come at the book of Isaiah. So we got to understand that throughout that time, Satan has always sought to kill and to destroy. Jesus Christ said at John chapter 10 that his job is to protect the sheep, but the thief, devil, seeks out to kill and to destroy the sheep. So we got to understand that's how Satan has always worked throughout history is through murder. So you got to understand this. If you don't think that Satan is literally, and I mean literally right now, seeking to kill people, then you're very ignorant, very ignorant. Now, who was the one who crucified our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross, putting the nails in his hand? The Jewish leaders, they started the riot, but who was the one who actually did it? It was Rome. So you got to understand this. Rome has always been the enemy of Christianity from the beginning Amen. till later on at the end. They've always committed murder. And when you study a lot of interesting things throughout history, you're going to find out this, which is very, very interesting. There's always some sort of Catholic involved. You wouldn't be surprised that the person's religion is Catholicism. Now, we've heard about the Jesuit order. And there's a Jesuit university, like, really close to us as well. So you got to understand this. Throughout, ever since the beginning of the Jesuit order, I don't know if you studied this, but during the English royalty and nations, they feared the Jesuits. Because Jesuits were always known for being for infiltrating and poisoning people through the cup. They always poisoned people through the cup. They, they committed a lot of assassinations. So a lot of English kings and different nations and royalties, they were killed by the hands of Jesuits. Uh, another example, for one example, we see King James. Now, in the production of your King James Bible, you think Satan's going to let it uh, slide and let it go? No. He's going to try to kill and to destroy. Uh, if you heard about Guy Fox and then Robert Catesby, these people, they were influenced by Jesuits. I don't know if you knew that. So, in fact, these assassins, when they tried to dig a hole underneath and try to blow up Parliament, and then some of you have heard about uh, Guy Fox, how they tried to attempt to blow up and etc. But you got to realize this, Jesuits and Catholics were involved in that. And then Robert Catesby, he was one of them who was involved and he had Jesuit influences. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, he protected his book because this book cannot be destroyed. Amen. This book cannot be destroyed. Now, there was a lot of Catholic influence trying to infiltrate the King James Bible. That's why your original King James Bible had the Apocrypha in it. Because, supposedly, there were two Jesuits who infiltrated somehow and they confessed. So, that's why originally the King James Bible had the Apocrypha in it. But the King James Bible translators, they were no fools. They knew that was not part of the genuine Word of God. So if you don't believe me, all you have to do is pick up a regular King James Bible, the ordinary one uh, from 1611, and look how 
in your Bible, current Bible today, you're going to find out that there's uh, literally the book of John, Genesis, no label on it. But in the apocryphal books, they literally put apocrypha, apocrypha on every page, top of the page. Just like if you were to go to the back of your Bible and it'll say index, index on the top. Or concordance, concordance on the top. So basically the apocrypha was simply added as extra notes. It was not considered part of the real Bible. Then the Catholic Church, you know what? They had a Dewey Rames Bible. That's a Catholic Bible. Two years before the King James Bible was published. That's interesting, isn't it? And then the assassination attempt against King James. What happened was is that they discovered what was going on and then they surrounded the assassins. They had a final sh uh, shootout and the Lord miraculously intervened where the assassins, they were about to shoot their way out, but their gunpowder was wet. <laughs> Coincidentally, their gunpowder got wet and then they tried to dry off the gunpowder by lighting a fire next to it. <laughs> so that was a, a dumb move. It blew up. They injured themselves. And one of them crawled to the image of a Virgin Mary, gave his last prayer, and died at the feet of the Virgin Mary. So these were def there were definitely Catholic influences involved ever since the beginning. Now what happened ever since then, some of you might not know this, but if you go through underground history, the Jesuits, it's very interesting how nations start to kick them out. So ever since the publication of the King James Bible, that is significant. The publication of the King James Bible destroyed the power of the Catholic Church forever. So the Jesuits had to go underground. In fact, Catholic nations and the Vatican itself kicked out the Jesuits during that time because they were just getting too much to handle. It wasn't until Napoleon Bonaparte that they started to restore their power after that. But during that time, the Jesuits, they got in touch, if you know your conspiracy theories, with Masons. They got in touch with the Masons, and then you have Rothschild who was funding a group called the Illuminati that time. Now, the Illuminati is not a fairy tale. It's actually a real historical event that happened. American presidents warned about the Illuminati. Now, what's considered to be myth today is that Illuminati uh, is, does not exist today. That's what's considered to be the myth, is that the Illuminati is alive and real today. They consider that to be a myth. But historically, they know that it's real. Now, what we believe is that the Illuminati in some form is alive today. That's what we truly believe in. Uh, people don't believe that. They think it's a myth. But during history, everyone agrees, including historians, that this is a real organization that existed during the American presidencies. So American presidents warned about the Illuminati. The Illuminati, it was funded by Rothschild, and the ones who got all this group together were the Jesuits. So the superior general, I believe, uh, I'm not sure if his last name was Ricky, but he basically got them together and he found Rothschild to fund it. And then Adam Weishaupt was the leader of the Illuminati that time. They founded the Illuminati at a Jesuit university at Bavaria. So why it consists of Masons, the Illuminati, is pretty evident. When the Illuminati supposedly uh, was out of the history books, and supposedly their power was lost. You know where the members fled to? Lodges. Lodges, Mason Lodges. That's why we believe that the power is still alive, and, uh, alive today. The organization itself in public is no longer available, but in Sikh reform, they're still alive. They fled to Lodges, and ever since then, it's pretty interesting if you read other people who are involved in Masonic Lodges, a lot of interesting conspiracies. But anyway, these people were involved in assassination attempts as well. So that's why presidents were fearful about this group of people. They would disguise themselves, infiltrate. In fact, if you read during the Great Awakening revivals, some preachers warned the people that you couldn't tell the difference between a Catholic and a Mason. Sometimes you couldn't tell the difference. Alberto Rivera, he was formerly a Jesuit priest, but when he kissed the ring of one of his superiors, his blood turned cold because it was a Masonic symbol on one of his superior's rings. So they're very intertwined, which is very interesting. You also got to understand this. These two groups are the ones who have blood oaths. These are the two groups who have blood oaths, and they made a blood oath that they would kill and destroy people who don't convert to the faith or if they betray their organization. But that's why certain sorority clubs, they'll do that just like a game. 
but you'll see Masonic symbols in today's sorority clubs, fraternity clubs, etc. Because why? It all came from this. It all came from this, which is scary. But anyway, these Jesuits, they were definitely involved for several examples. They did one on King James. Perhaps they did it on Washington, which is pretty interesting. So, but I'm not going to get too much detailed into that. Supposedly, it was a cold, and then because of that, that's why he got fatally ill, and then through bloodletting, he died. But um, some people, they, said, they theorized that Lincoln, he always wore a heavy coat, coat whenever he was out, so there was no way he got a cold. But he did take a, some strange drink from a general, actually. And then from thence, he got sick or ill, so to speak. And then some of the signs that uh, Washington went through was similar with other kings throughout history who died by the cup. It was usually by the cup that Jesuits killed kings and rulers. But anyway, that's the theory. I cannot tell. But Lincoln was definitely a case where Jesuits were involved. You read Charles Chiniqui's book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome. This man knew Lincoln. He was a personal friend. And he has one of the best books it is a great book for Roman Catholics, 50 years in the Church of Rome. He loved the Roman Catholic Church. He was dedicated, and he was a very close friend of Lincoln. But he knew real quick that the Jesuits, they wanted Lincoln's head. So when Lincoln was, assassin, uh, was killed by John Wicks Booth and other people, you got to realize this. If not all, nearly all of them were Catholic by religion. Now, all you have to do is read 50 years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinicki, as well as a book uh, called The Betrayal by Jack Chick in comic book format. They'll give you the names of Wick, uh, John Wick's Boots' relatives and friends who are Catholic. So they did the assassination. Uh, they killed Lincoln. Catholics were definitely involved with Lincoln. Then you got the famous one, who killed JFK, right? That was pretty famous. Catholics were also involved with the assassin, uh, with the killing of JFK as well. Now, isn't it interesting that JFK is the uh, one of the earliest presidents who was Catholic and then became president of the United States? So JFK, he was one of those presidents, earliest presidents who was Catholic and then became president of the United States. So the Vatican, you gotta understand this, Vatican and elites, how it works in a power play system is that they will use a certain pawn to fulfill their bidding. But when the pawn fulfills its role and gets too powerful, they need to take the pawn out of the way. So JFK, he was getting onto the CIA. He once said, I'm going to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. So then the conspiracies are obviously where intelligent agencies and high elites were involved. But what's very interesting is that uh, there were multiple people who were involved in this assassination. It's not just one specific person. There were multiple groups who were involved in this. And what's very interesting is that if you go through these kind of multiple groups, such as the underground crime world, and then you also go through uh, the intelligence agencies, you got to realize this, which is very interesting. You can't separate a Catholic root from that. For example, the CIA was founded by William Donovan. He's the father of the CIA. You know what he was? Catholic Knights of Malta. That's even, that's even in Wikipedia, an amateur source for the public. Not only that, uh, the FBI, its, found, its founder, J. Edgar Hoover, this is no secret, it's public information. He was Mason. He was Masonic, J. Edgar Hoover. So you see how there's so much intertwining. By the way, some of you don't know this. Joseph Kennedy, Kennedy's father, you know what he was? Knights of Malta. Wow. Knights of Malta. Some of you might go, what is Knights of Malta? Knights of Malta, they also have their own secret organization, like the Masons. Knights of Malta, they're just as powerful, if not more powerful, than Masons and even some Jewish elites, possibly even Rothschild. You probably didn't know that. So Knights of Malta, they're very, uh, if you look them up, even in their own domain, they're one of the very few groups that can be a religious order that does not have to be uh, tied to government interference. So they have their own military, economic, and stuff like that, their own power in a religious form. That should scare you. 
that should scare you when there's a church or a religion that can have that much power to do something. But anyway, so it's very interesting that JFK's father, he was also Knights of Malta. But then he fulfilled its role and he was going to pound onto the CIA, so they had to get him out of the way. Not only that, the mafia, I don't know if you knew this, but the father of the mafia, he was also Catholic. But think about it, even today, how many majority of them are Catholic today? Think about that. Yeah. Uh, I could go into story after story where they did use, uh, it's a matter of fact where mafia people were involved to help out during World War II. They did some government biddings for them. They did some government biddings for them. Anyways, so you see how Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. And he always had to kill and to destroy. Why? To keep his power going. That's how he works. Now you had like the current ones going on with Donald Trump. You heard about that big ruckus going on when there was like a laser pointed uh, thing pointed at Donald Trump. And then suddenly it seemed like that they had to finish the whole thing. So it, po it possibly was just one of those lightings. It maybe wasn't a real thing. But, it's all, but you got to consider the fact as well. You got to consider the fact that Jesuits have always done assassination attempts. And you don't know this, but just like JFK had Catholic influence, Donald Trump, he graduated from a Catholic university, yep. Fordham University. Mm -hmm. See? So we don't know all the details of what's going on. And so you have to be careful when you get on details and then you come up with uh, weird things. But it is a matter of fact that Jesuits, if you go th throughout history, they were involved in assassinations. And also, you can't separate a Catholic from some kind of suspect out there. You'll be very surprised. You'll be very surprised how much widespread Catholic influence is. Now, think about it. What is the ultimate thing that Satan can do through this? Look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. The ultimate thing that Satan can accomplish, think about it. People started to deify these figures when they got killed, right? When they got killed, all of a sudden, these people were deified. All Satan has to do is pull up an assassination attempt on a one-world uh, one ruler. And when he dies, the whole world, they're going to say, what a great guy he was. What a great president he was. He'd done so many things for us. So the whole world will finally support this leader, even though they disagreed with him to begin with. Think about it. During Lincoln's day, he was living in a divisive era. A lot of people didn't like him. But then after he died, all of a sudden, everyone's starting to think that he's a hero and start to unite a little more. All you have to do is kill somebody, and then people will start to act sympathetic. Now they don't talk bad about Michael Jackson anymore. They deify him for two months, two months on the news after he passed away. All you have to do is when this figure has a hard time ruling nations, because the Bible says he's conquering and to conquer. Daniel chapter 7 and 11 says the whole nation... All the nations don't agree with him yet. But when you kill him, then what are they all going to do? Oh, what a great guy he was. He'd done so many things for us. And now they're on board with him. Yeah. And then if great. Satan resurrects that leader from the dead, Dang. then he gets all the world to worship him. Look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. So you see right here, it's like a gunshot wound, like, uh, like Lincoln, shot in the head. So it's like a gunshot wound right here. And then what happens? When he, he was wounded to death. So he had a wound that killed him. But look at this. And his deadly wound was healed. Now look at this. And all, see, all the world this time, wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Look at that. See, now all the world gets on board, and that's Satan's successful attempt. Satan's successful attempt is that one day, just as these people have deified Lincoln and JFK, all you have to get is this kind of figure one day. And this kind of figure, he's, he's not going to get all Republicans, Democrats, and all the nations around the world on board with him. You get Rush, uh, communist and uh, Muslim nations still having tensions with the Antichrist. But all you have to do is when he gets killed, 
and they start to think about what great things that he's done and they start to reflect on their own actions. And then when he gets resurrected, he'll be deified too, just like these two guys. I mean, think about it. If we had Lincoln back and JFK back, what do you think the world would do after that? Think about what we do when we get this guy back. The Bible says all the world, what do they do? They worship the beast. They wonder after him. That's what happens when you resurrect this person from the dead. So Satan, that's always been his attempt, is to kill so that he can gain power. By the way, it is a matter of fact, if you study some theosophist societies and some dark things about elites, they mention this. In order to have their own kingdom of peace, there must be chaos first. There must be destruction and death first. Why is that? It's imitating God Almighty. You can only get life from the death, except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, then it can bring forth what? Much fruit after that. Yeah. Jesus Christ, by his death, we have endless life and eternal life. And then that gospel has been preached for the past 2,000 years. Satan, you'll find what's very interesting is he always imitates. He always imitates what God does throughout the dispensations. That is Satan's tactic and plan.